So, yeah, thank you everyone uh, for joining us despite the atypical timing, but also for uh, a talk uh, that's a little bit uh, different from the kind of topics that we've been touching on recently. So uh, Janay Cheikh is going to talk to us today about his book, recent book. Um, the talk is titled Outcast Bombay and the Translation of Marxism. And uh, you've all read the abstract that we sent out. So I will not read the abstract out, but we're really, really grateful to Janet for agreeing to join us at short notice and at the very odd time uh, for him. And, uh, but actually we, we're getting your first bright hour. I mean, whatever, the, yeah, the yeah. brightest part <laughs> yeah. of the, in the beginning of the day. So uh, we look forward to, to hearing you speak. And as you know, uh, we'll, we'll let you speak and then we'll come at you with questions. For people who've joined us, please feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourself, to put in questions um, uh, all through the talk and we'll take them up uh, once he's finished. Over to you, Janine. Firstly, thank you for inviting me. I don't know too many people in Delhi, actually. Uh, so this is a great way to get to know some of you. I know people by their work. I, I read them, but I've ne I have not seen them face to face or met them face to face. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you for coming at this odd hour. I know this is uh, evening time. People are busy with uh, life, work, families, etc. So thank you. Uh, I'll uh, start by sc sharing screen and uh, uh, putting my presentation, and then I can proceed from there. Uh, just let me just share. Uh, a book and uh, a book like Outcast Bombay to get it all together in a forty-five minute format, you know, was uh, is a little challenging, even for the writer uh, himself, right? Uh, so what I thought was I'll focus on two chapter on one chapter really, and then give you a sense of how the book is proceeding. So hopefully you'll have a sense of the book, uh, and if you have questions about the different chapters, I'm uh, happy to answer them. Uh, hopefully you'll see how this chapter that I'm presenting on Marxism, which is chapter two of the book, is uh, connected uh, connecting with some of the other chapters. Okay. Just, uh... So the question, the important question uh, that for the book was, what is the history of caste in Bombay City? Uh, and it's an important question because there is a perception, of course, that the you know caste uh, in urban areas you really don't get much to uh, study. Uh, uh, many empirical resources. Uh, somebody like Amin Srinivas had said this too in the 20th century uh, that. Uh, there's not enough material to study caste in urban India. That's the perception. I'm not saying that's the uh, uh, that's how scholars now, many scholars are working on caste in urban settings. Uh, so the assumption is that caste sort of withers away when you migrate to the city, when somebody is migrating to the city, uh, and uh, therefore there is no, there is a perception of castelessness. And if there are caste practices that remain maybe like untouchability, for instance, that it's really the social reformers will deal with it. They'll address it, they'll, re they'll resolve it. So the argument is, my argument is that in the city, caste hides in plain sight. Right? And two sites that I explored were the built environment and language. Right? Uh, so the language that I'm, uh, the, the presentation today will talk about the language of Marxism, of translating Marxism. Uh, but the other chapters are dealing also with the build, built environment when it comes to built environment. Of course, it's housing uh, and urban planning. And I argue in the book that caste was uh, also important to these uh, things. I'm a historian, so I proceed uh, chronologically. Uh, you know, there is a, you'll see a chronology here, though in between chapters I move around. But it's, you know, you start, I start uh, with the 18, uh, with the 19th century, 1880s and 1890s, and then proceed all the way. Uh, my entry to this uh, project was through my interest in labor history. So 
And there was a lot of scholarship on labor history on Bombay city in this period, particularly the early part, of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. And the other point of entry was, uh, uh, of course, the Dalit uh, literary movement. And uh, because uh, you know, I'm a historian, that became the exit point and that literary movement uh, really took hold uh, in the 1960s and 70s. So the thesis of the book is that industrial capitalism in Bombay attached itself to caste. Right? And it leached on caste. So if you want to start an industry in Bombay in the 19th century, uh, not only do you need, uh, you tap your caste and kinship, uh, kinship network to raise capital to start an industry. Many merchants did that. Merchants who had made their money in uh, the opium trade with China. Uh, but also then once you've started the industry, you need labor and you need uh, in India from the 19th century, you need really cheap labor. To get, to make labor cheap, you have to bring in more and more and more possible workers into the city. So if you have, let's say a demand for a hundred thousand workers, you have to make sure that there are 300,000 workers in the city who land up at the factory gates at the docks, right? So, uh, uh, and that, uh, in that way you can keep the wage down. So the working class in Bombay is really underemployed, A, uh, and also uh, paid lower, right? That's the feature of industrial capitalism. Uh, but in order to get those workers to the city, in order to uh, uh, house the workers once they come to the city, uh, jobbers, industrialists, uh, through jobbers relied on caste. Right. So caste was important to recruit workers, to discipline workers, because the jobber was also disciplining workers, but also to reproduce a labor force right. through housing and et cetera, because housing was also, uh, the, through the jobber, you can also get access to housing. Uh, the the Dalits, of course, are the focus of the books, uh, of this book, of Outcast Bombay. And many Dalits, of course, in terms of work, were working in uh, lower paying jobs in textile industries and uh, the construction that's happening around there in hospitals, docks, sanitation department. And many were uh, not allowed to rent tenements or chores and therefore had to live in slums. Okay. Uh, th there's also, of course, a different... Uh, 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 when uh, the, the, the city of Bombay uh, Improvement Trust uh, came into being, they also considered caste uh, in allotting tenements to uh, workers. And there was a survey that was going around and I've cited that survey in the book. Uh, so uh, there's that so in the tenements of the BIT and the BDT, caste was considered and there were ch chores that were allotted to Dalits. Uh, in these tenements. So there's that. But many could not afford or were not allowed, particularly in uh, ten uh, tenements owned by uh, landlords. So they perforce had to live in slums. So, and here is a example of that. This have directly borrowed from A.R. Bernard Hurst, uh, uh, who has this. Uh, and uh, according to him, A.R. Bernard Hurst was an economist who did his research in the 1910s and then he published this book in the 1920s, 1925 to be precise. And uh, he, according to him, some of the people who are living in these sheds or many of the people who are living in these sheds were Dalits. Right? Stin sheds and these Zavli sheds. So this was uh, just a brief synopsis of first uh, industrial capitalism leeching on caste, uh, some questions on housing. Now, Marxism, of course, uh, arrives with, in, uh, with gusto in Bombay in the 1920s. Uh, before that, uh, as some scholars have pointed out, by the 1910s, people in India are familiar with Marxist writings, uh, and possibly even earlier. But the evidence is uh, from the 1910s. In the 1920s, Marxism catches the imagination of uh, some intellectuals in Bombay city. And it had to address this question of industrial capitalism and caste. Right. 
because if capitalism would be overcome through a political revolution, A, how would the revolution come about? And then that revolution will, uh, is, should be followed by a social revolution. So if there, it's going to be a social revolution, a feature, an important feature of social hierarchy is caste. So how would the people reading a Marxist revolution deal with, address the question of caste? Right. So the question was, how do you conceptualize the Indian revolution and uh, what sort of uh, literature were they uh, reading? How were they making sense of that literature? Right. That, that is a very interesting question, actually. How were they, what were they reading and what sense were they making? Because if you see uh, Marxism, uh, Marxist literature, as soon as it starts arriving, there is a, uh, there is a uh, intelligence apparatus that is keeping an eye on Bolshevik, communist, and on Marxist literature that is coming to Bombay. Okay. So it's difficult for many things to arrive in Bombay. Uh, and some of the things that arrive in Bombay are really actually many from, uh, you know, what would be called social, socialist, social democratic uh, uh, intellectuals from Germany, United States, Britain, uh, and nothing, not much from the Soviet Union at this time. Uh, there is no, for instance, there is no collective, collected works of Marx and Engels, uh, which only ha really uh, happens in the 1940s and 1950s and later on, in fact. Uh, so what arrives in Bombay and what Marxist intellectuals can lay their hands on and what they can read and what they can make sense of is an important question because they're reading whatever comes to hand, right? Which, are, uh, which is not much. So... For instance, some of the books that are seized by the CID include books like uh, Roy's India in Transition. Uh, there is the American socialist Daniel de Leon's book. Uh, there is T.J. Holmes's book. So these and there are there is a in, in this list there are many other books. But these are some of the books that have uh, arrived in Bombay and have been confiscated by the intelligence departments. So you get a sense of some of the books that are arriving in the city. An interesting and, uh, insight when I was reading on uh, for this chapter was uh, uh, that actually a landlord and a merchant played an important role in the transmission of Marxism in, in, uh, in Bombay. Uh, so there's this landlord by named Ranchor Das Lotwala. Uh, an interesting figure because not only is he propagating Marxist socialist literature in Bombay, but he's also uh, propagating literature of the Arya Samaj and he's funding the Arya Samaj too. Uh, which is also, uh, you know, many Marxists in the 1920s and 30s uh, are part of either caste uh, movements too, or caste organizations, and are reading literature, which is, you know, they're reading the Bhagavad Gita. Many of them read the Bhagavad Gita alongside reading um, the Marxist pamphlets that are they can lay their hands on. So Lotwala had a press and he was, uh, the managing director of Hindustan, uh, and uh, he uh, had a daily called uh, the Hindustan. And he, on his travels to England and in Europe, he had collected some literature on Marxism and Leninism uh, in Europe. And he brings some of it to Bombay and he brings it to Bombay City. And it's in his personal library that somebody like uh, uh, Sripad Amrit Dange, I say Dange, who was one of the foremost Marxists uh, in India and certainly the foremost Marxist in Bombay city, he reads the Communist Manifesto for the first time in his library. Uh, he reads it in 1922 after he has written a famous pamphlet called Gandhi versus Lenin, which I'll speak about in just a little bit. So uh, he reads the Communist Manifesto there. And Hindustan Press publishes this Communist Manifesto in English. And also, pamphlets like wage labor and capital. Uh, uh, Lotwala also starts the Ranchordas uh, Lotwala Trust for the pro propagation of socialism. And it's really rent from his building that is being allotted to propagate socialism in uh, Bombay city. So private property is funding the propagation of socialism. Again, it's a uh, 
very interesting uh, say, uh, thing that I personally discovered. Or I found it interesting when I read it. So Dange believed that uh, Lotwala was very important to the early propagation of socialism uh, in Bombay city. He had, uh, among other things, he uh, had uh, started, bought this Marathi newspaper called the Hindu Prakash. Uh, and in that Hindu Prakash had then some articles that were published on Lenin uh, and um, Dange had commissioned these articles. Uh, Lotwala had read uh, Gandhi versus Lenin, the pamphlet that I had mentioned earlier, and uh, uh, he was really uh, he was impressed by uh, by Dange's pamphlet. Dange was Dange was a young uh, man at this time. He was probably only twenty or twenty one when he had written this pamphlet and published it. He was very impressed by it. Uh, uh, Dange, if you read the pamphlet, he for him Gandhi is uh, uh, too nonviolent. Lenin and his method is violent. So he's, uh, Dange really sees uh, Tilak as the synthesis between uh, Gandhi and Lenin. And he is a great admirer of Tilak. And in fact, uh, he has read more of Tilak than he's read uh, uh, much of Marx, particularly in the early in the 1920s. Uh, so when he's reading Marx and Marxism, he's making sense of Marxism through the prism of Tilak and Tilak's writing. And uh, interestingly, you'll uh, see a direct link between Tilak, or you can trace a link between Tilak, Dange, and then somebody like uh, Bal Thakre, the leader of the Shiv Sena, who was really Im inspired by, uh, by Dange and thought of him as sort of a guru and was inspired by the way Dange addressed public meetings and spoke and had styled in, uh, himself on Dange. So you can see that link that goes through. Dange later on also starts a weekly uh, called or edited a weekly called The Socialists. And that's where many uh, early Bombay Marxists uh, who propagated uh, socialism, they circulated around, uh, they, they, uh, he cultivated them. Uh, people like S.V. Ghate, S.V. Deshpande. Uh, and they became the founders of, uh, early founders of the Communist Party of India in 1925. Uh, but Dange, of course, is in uh, jail by this time. In 1924, he's uh, is in jail because of what is known as the Kanpur conspiracy case. So Dange is not present at the founding of the Communist Party of India in India. There is, of course, there is also debate about the founding of the Communist Party of India because uh, the first Communist Party of India uh, is founded in Tashkent in 1920, but the Communist Party of India uh, in India is founded in 1925. They, of course, the Ranchodas Lotwala uh, or uh, the postal service, because the postal, uh, uh, the books and pamphlets were sent through the postal service. Uh, these are not the only ways in which Marxism trickled into the city, right? It's also people like uh, Babu Karim, uh, who uh, was uh, uh, not much uh, educated and worked for, uh, in the 1910s, worked uh, as a hotel, hotel boy in Bombay City, uh, and eventually found a job as a, a Laskar on a ship, as a Starantia, a Scottish-owned uh, uh, company. And because he was a Laskar, then he got an opportunity to travel around the world, uh, particularly uh, in Europe. And that's where uh, Babu Karim comes in contact with uh, labor leaders, Marxist leaders, that's where he collects uh, uh, pamphlets, installs, or communist literature installs in uh, Glasgow, Liverpool, Manchester, and he brings them to India. He's finally arrested in 1934, but between in from the 1920s until the early 1930s, he's you know on his trips, he's collecting and bringing literature, uh, which he can't understand. He's giving it to his friends to read and uh, decipher. Uh, uh, he can understand a little bit. He's picked up the language a little bit. Uh, because of uh, his travels. Uh, but uh, it's with the help of uh, his friends, he's making sense of Marxism. He's finally arrested in 1934. There are other leaders too that I'll, I'll talk about. People like uh, R.B. More, who was uh, active both in the Dalit and the Marxist movement. 
and uh, somebody called T. Palan, who was also uh, 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 identified as a Dalit, but also as a, a, as a communist. I'll talk about them just a little bit. So now if you want to, you're reading Marx, whatever literature you can uh, lay your hands on. And then in the 1920s, through the party, through some of the trade unions that you will start and dominate uh, in the 1920s, you're also trying to propagate Marxism okay, and help people understand the vision of revolution, the social transfer, the political and social transformation that uh, Marxism promises. Okay. In order to do that, Marxism has to be translated. So uh, well, the talk, uh, the, the remainder of the talk will talk about this process of translation. Translation of translating some of the Marxian conceptual categories into, uh, uh, into Marathi. Uh, this is the case that I'm studying. Uh, but also Marxian sociology to understand Indian society. Right? How do you understand hierarchy in Indian society in which caste is an important feature? So uh, from very early on, Marxists had to address the caste question. They had to say something about caste. If nothing else, at least to say that caste really is class. In the way uh, Marxists and particularly somebody like uh, S.A. Dange who uh, hurls himself into this task of translating Marx or decoding Marx for his uh, audience, uh, for the revolutionaries around him, but also for then later on for the workers. The way he and then also other figures at this time understand ca uh, caste is that capitalism will desiccate caste and weaken it. And then their goal would be to aggregate these workers and lead them into a, for a, uh, into a class revolution, who will be the vanguard for a class revolution. And in this process of this revolution, even caste will, uh, caste and even the vestiges of caste will disappear. But of course, uh, theory was out of sync with practice because as I've said, uh, capitalism relied on caste centrally, uh, industrial capitalism relied on caste centrally in Bombay in the late 19th and 20th century. So apart from Dange, it's uh, Roy, for instance, is saying that caste is not a living factor. Somebody like R.P. Dutt is saying caste will be overcome by the advance of modern industry and political democracy. So Marxists had a sort of a ready reckoner for the disappearance of caste, right? Capitalism is doing an important work in this. Modernity is doing an important work in this. But based on how caste will get, uh, will be dismantled, how did they understand the emergence of caste? Right. And uh, Dange, again, as I was saying, he, he applied himself to this task and uh, you know, he uh, borrowed a lot from mythology and did a reading of uh, mythology uh, uh, and history to uh, argue that there was an Aryan commune in Indian antiquity, which was uh, which was a paradise, right? And this Aryan commune that over a period of time devolves into, uh, uh, because of division of labor, devolves, caste solidifies in India's feudal uh, era, which is then weakened by capitalism and will be then completely vanquished by uh, socialism. Right? That's his theory of uh, what will happen to caste. The emergence, of course, is uh, uh, in this devolution from the Aryan commune to uh, the Indian feudalism. So uh, if you read Dange, actually, it's really, it's really fascinating. And uh, also, sometimes you wonder what was he smoking when he was writing some of these things. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, he he calls his reading economic determinism 
And he argues that Bhagavad Gita supports his reading on economic de determinism. And I have a quote from what he says. Uh, the Gita lends indirectly its support to Marxism or, uh, and its expl explanation of history to the theory of economic de uh, determinism. So if you say that when uh, Krishna is saying that guna and karma are uh, the basis for the creation of the Varna system, is saying it's a, really nothing. It's what he's saying really is that uh, it was created through uh, uh, the division of labor and through economic necessity. Of course, Dange is writing in the 1920s, and by then, you know, there are critiques of caste by the anti-caste uh, and uh, particularly the non-Brahmin movement and the anti-caste movement. Uh, particular people like in Western India, people like Jyoti Rao Phule and Ambedkar have already laid out their theory of caste where they've said that it's really the Brahmins who have created the caste system to justify the, uh, the dispossession of uh, the indigenous people. Yeah. Even Ambedkar in his caste in India, a famous essay from 1970s has uh, has critiqued precisely this functional view of caste, that caste is really division of labor. He says, uh, he points to the important role of the Brahmins and uh, uh, I said, because of the prestige associated with uh, Brahminical learning, that caste then becomes imitable. People want to copy it then. Uh, and that's how caste is perpetuated and becomes robust. So, because, I mean, as you can imagine, the way Marxists, some of the Marxists, um, the way Dange is understanding caste, which uh, according to him, caste has already been weakened by, the, by industrial capitalism. So then if there is mobilization, which he sees happening along the lines of caste, yeah, for instance, in the anti-Brahmin movement or the Dalit movement, then that was met with uh, angry rebukes, right? I, so, so, for instance, uh, the non brahmin movement was accused of being uh, unpatriotic and narrow-visioned. Uh, he often branded the non brahmin and Dalit leaders as petty bourgeois who only want the share of spoils of colonialism. So, uh, he, and even when uh, some of the non-Brahmin uh, leaders in the communist movement who are also active in the non-Brahmin movement, he also, of course, critiqued them, right? Critiques them for fostering what he believes is strong anti-Brahmin feeling among workers. Right? So these uh, uh, non-Brahmin uh, uh, leaders' mobilizations are accused as fascist, reactionary, etc. His words. And then on their part, of course, even Alve and Kasle call some of their colleagues uh, communist Brahmin. Some of these debates are, uh, some of these uh, uh, rhetorical uh, 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 parades are happening in uh, Mir during the jail in Meerut, actually. Uh, where in the Meerut conspiracy case, uh, there's a uh, Talk, talks about these caste movement and says really uh, these uh, the Dalit movement particularly of 1931-32 this is at the time of uh, the Pune Pact but it's also when uh, many communists are in jail in Mira he calls the Dalit movement artificial and ultimately reactionary uh, the early Understanding of uh, Marxism is really by intellectuals who could understand English, right? People like Dange, etc. Uh, it's really after 1924-25 that they decide that we should translate Marxism, Marxist pamphlets into regional languages. So, so the Bengali translation happens, I think, in 26, if I'm not mistaken. The Bombay translation of uh, the Communist Manifesto happens in 1931, right? And it's done by two publishing houses. Uh, by Kamgar Vangmay Prasarak Mandal and the Marxist Vangmay Prasarak Mandal. As you can imagine, of course, these are uh, affiliated with two different factions of uh, 
the communists who were in the city at this time, who were left in the city. Uh, uh, Bombay at this time, of course, is driven with factional dispute. And by many accounts, there are three factions uh, because there's also M.N. Roy who has returned to uh, India and who's also in Bombay at around this time. And he is also part of a faction and he also starts a publishing house. Um, so uh, they, these publishing houses, they, some, uh, some of them publish, one of them publishes uh, the Communist Manifesto, the other publishes Wage, Labor and Capital. Some people, of course, are also, uh, are also working with both uh, publishers. Uh, it's not that there is a strict uh, line. Uh, somebody like Gangadhar Adhikari's siblings, uh, for instance, is working with both. And that's a, this is also the one of the arguments, key arguments in this chapter, is that when you're translating Marxian conceptual categories into uh, the, uh, into Marathi, the categories the language that you borrow, the terms that you borrow are really from Sanskrit or Sanskritized Marathi, right? In, in, the, uh, in the chapter in the book, of, I've given a long history of how uh, uh, borrowing from Sheldon Pollock, of how, uh, how Marathi replaces Sanskrit, how it comes into being, uh, the, the Marathi public sphere in, uh, in which some of these debates are happening in the 19th and 20th uh, in the century, uh, uh, all that, there's a background there. The, but because of uh, the, uh, what happens is when the, in the translation of Marxism, the abstract categories, the conceptual categories get rendered in Sanskrit or Sanskritized Marathi. But the embodied categories, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the lumpen proletariat becomes the Mavali. Uh, 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 so the abstract categories, so for instance, uh, value is mulya, use value, pyukta, so et cetera. There are many others that are uh, rendered in this way. Uh, the reason I, I brought up uh, the Lumpen proletariat and the Mavali, because Mavali becomes a very important figure. Mavali is also in their notes to the translation of the communist manifesto, which is called the communist Jahirama. Uh, they uh, are, are also referring to the Lumpen, Lumpen proletariat as the slum proletariat. Uh, proletariat. So this uh, figure of the slum becomes uh, important. And, Mavali, this uh, Mavali itself becomes important. Mavali, you know, the origins of the term Mavali is also very interesting. Uh, for the longest time, I uh, thought, like many other scholars, that Mavali is really a rendition of uh, people from the Marvel region of uh, of, the, of Western Maharashtra. Uh, Marvelas, Shivaji was a Marvela, so uh, uh, that Marvel region. Uh, but Mavali could also be, I later realized, and. Uh, Arabic term actually, and uh, uh, could be the history of the term could also come from Arabic where the non-Islamic uh, people are called uh, Mavali. Okay. So in uh, the spread of Islam, uh, the people who are uh, uh, in places where Islam had become prominent, the non-Islamic, the non-Muslims are called uh, Mavali. I, I'm not sure now which, uh, the, the, which one the the, uh, the translators of the Communist Manifesto, which one they had in mind, uh, I, the Marvels, but Mavali is a word that is, of course, uh, in circulation. And they use that to describe the lumpen proletariat or the slum proletariat. Later on uh, in the 1950s and 60s when, uh, and, and 70s, when Dalit literature uh, becomes, uh, 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 comes into being, the, uh, the Mavali acquires new uh, significance because for somebody like Namdev Dasal, a famous uh, Dalit writer, Mavali is the Dalit, right? He's also thinking of Mavali, the Lumpen proletariat as the Dalit. Uh, uh, and many writers like Bagul, for instance, also, uh, the, what they do is they use this term, uh, borrow this term from this Marathi Marxist oeuvre, the, the Mavali, and then they sort of run with it, uh, inverted because they humanize the Mavali. So the sex worker, the underemployed, uh, the, the Mavali, the, under, the underemployed worker, etc. They are humanized uh, in some of this literature by Dalit writers in the 60s and 70s, which I've, which I've spoken about, particularly in chapter five of the book. Right. And somebody, uh, and something like slaves are translated as Siddhi Gulam. Right. So 
that this is a you can see a hierarchy in language in translating abstract categories and in embodied categories. Ambedkar from the 1920s uh, had particularly the this is because of the strikes in Bombay in the 1920s and uh, 2829. Ambedkar ha had reservations about a communist revolution and uh, in an anonymous article quite likely written by Ambedkar himself. I'm not sure though, because the, it's not attributed, but it's a weekly started by Ambedkar called uh, Samta. And in this, he has a stinging critique, uh, rebuke of the communists. And he says they have little knowledge of the strength of Brahminism in India. Their heads are in Russia while their bodies are in India. So, he says when uh, and the article says when communists are produced in the untouchable and backward class, then we'll see that Marxism uh, or communism will be in India will be self-reflexive. Uh, but and there were of course uh, Dalits uh, who embraced Marxism, who were part of the Marxist movement. Uh, but this uh, R. B. Murray and his uh, Mamoas, uh, Mamoas have been translated recently by uh, uh, Anu Rao and Vandana Sonalkar. So Rao, um, R.B. More is one of them. And R.B. More, of course, read Marxist uh, pamphlets uh, because he's uh, inspired by the bomb, the workers' strike. He's living in that area. He's attending these workers' meetings. He's listening to labor leaders uh, talking about strikes, talking about various things. Um, and he is curious about uh, Marxism, and he then uh, uh, with the help of intellectuals, he also starts a reading group in Bombay Chal for Dalits. I hope I haven't uh, overshot the map. So he tr uh, tries to, after joining the um, the communist uh, the Communist Party of India. He, of course, also has a foothold, a uh, toehold in, uh, is uh, aligned with uh, Ambedkar's uh, movement too. And he's trying to bring about a, a, an ideological, uh, uh, sort of, a, he wants to bring about a dialogue between on, uh, on communism and caste, uh, an alliance between uh, the communist and the Dalit movement right, to address the tension between class and caste. This was the other person I was uh, talking about who went to the Communist University of the Toilers of the East, uh, was active in the Matunga labor camp, the Haravi area of Bombay at that time, uh, but unfortunately uh, contracted TB and died in 1932, very soon after coming back to India from the Soviet Union. In the moment, uh, this elections that come about, the provincial elections that happen in India after the Government of India Act of 1935 and the elections in 1937, it's at that time that uh, Ambedkar realizes that an elections will be held and he starts the Independent Labour Party. And it's at that time that he's acknowledging that capitalism uh, is an important thing that has to be addressed and Brahminism. Right. So he's saying both capitalism and Brahminism were the enemies. So you can almost see that uh, somebody, somebody, what a position that somebody like More had a little earlier, Ambedkar is a sort of in agreement with this uh, by the 19, late uh, 1930s. Right. Brahminism privileged some workers and disadvantaged many others. So he says that both should be dismantled simultaneously. Right. Uh, both class and caste. Uh, should be dismantled simultaneously. But the provincial elections, of course, happen, and uh, uh, the uh, very interestingly, at around this time, the non Brahmin leadership uh, in uh, Western India they end up entering the Congress party. Right? Uh, which, uh, much, much to the annoyance and uh, Chagrin of, of Ambedkar. Uh, so just more information, by the way. So uh, this dialogue that could possibly have taken place in the 1930s or from the 1930s onwards, this really does not uh, uh, take place. Uh, because in practice, the way in which uh, uh, communism and particularly the, the trade unions affiliated with the, com uh, with the communist uh, movement, uh, the way they worked, 
is that in practice, the trade union movement become, became a way for some of the more uh, upper caste, by upper caste, I mean the upper caste among the lower caste, to dominate, uh, in this instance, uh, the Maratha and Kunbi in Western India and Bombay, to dominate some of the better paying jobs in, in Bombay, particularly in the textile industry, also in the dog. Three alliances, they came together during strikes or fought elections. During elections, they uh, came together uh, uh, yeah, sometimes on a plank, or which is uh, uh, when they were averse to some of the policies of the Congress Party. Many, of course, communists were working in the, Cong in the Congress Party, particularly in the 20s and 30s. And by the time of Ambedkar's death, of course, um, uh, there, were, there was a disquiet between many uh, uh, many Dalits and uh, uh, the communist movement and many Dalits have kept away from the Marxists. Uh, uh, but in Bombay city, you still find people like uh, uh, Baburo Bagul or uh, either a little earlier, somebody like Annabhav Sathe. Uh, but these people had grown up with all these movements together. Baburo Bagul says that in the 40s and 50s, he was attending meetings by Dalit leaders, by the communists, by the socialists. And somebody like uh, Bagul and, uh, uh, and uh, also Namde Dasal, as I mentioned, they borrow categories from Marathi Marxism uh, uh, into their under, uh, uh, in Dalit literature. So Marathi Marxism uh, and some of its categories have a uh, extended life in, uh, in Dalit literature, in their understanding of relationship within a family, uh, how re relationships have been commodified Right. In the understanding of the Mawali itself, uh, Mawalis are important figures in, in these. The Lumpen proletariat is an important figure in the literature. So let me uh, conclude. So just to uh, synthesize what I was saying, that uh, the hope was that uh, capitalism and communism will get make caste redundant. Um, but as I have argued that capitalism latched onto caste and was leeching on caste. So caste in fact had got a new life albeit in a changed form in Bombay. The communist leaders of course were dismissive of uh, caste mobilization. Uh, R.B. Morey of course, but tried to work out the synthesis for the uh, synthesis between these two movements where he believed or he hoped that uh, the emancipation of labor and the annihilation of caste will happen simultaneously. That was his belief, which is why he and then his son and then his grandson have stayed with the Communist Party. Uh, now the grandson with the Communist Party of India Marxists. So the implication is that in order to understand Marxism in India and or the vernacularization, vernacularization of Marxism, it's important to pay attention to the particular history of translation, the context of translation, the ways in which, and even pay attention to language right, and or conceptual categories. And in this process, you know, the, I you will have to, in, uh, deal with questions of caste, casteism, and the Dalit movement, as happens in Bombay city. So let me stop here. I'll stop share. Thank you so much. We already have a couple of questions. Uh, sure. I'll actually, Radhika, why don't you unmute and ask? I mean, your first question, and then, I don't know, maybe both together and then we can move to the other questions. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Muktan. It's also really nice to see you back. Yes, here. I know. Welcome. I, I'm glad you came. Yeah. Um, Junaid, thanks for the very interesting talk. And actually, I'm also working on translation of Marxism. Oh, you are? Oh, wow. In, uh, just right, finishing up the PhD. So it's, it's really interesting. And thank you. Uh, so I was actually also struggling with understanding um, 
Let me switch on my video actually. Of understanding uh, the term Mawali, uh, right. as I mean, from your APW paper actually, uh, which was oh, very yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I I was doing some research and it 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 does appear. I mean, I'm, it it was all conjecture on my part. Right. Um, so thank you for bringing up the Arabic meaning of it because I was wondering. I mean, when I was looking it up, it seemed that they were non-Muslims within the Islamic empire, but then were offered protection in exchange for right. them being soldiers. Right. Um, and this is around the same time that the Mughals, I mean, not just before, but around the same time that the Mughals are entering the Deccan. Right. Uh, uh, so right. I was yeah. just wondering then, and then you have the Mughals who are right. actually of part yeah. of the yeah. you know, and there yeah. is a link over there then in terms of them being part of both uh, the Mughal um, army and then, you know, like Shivaji's in the- Absolutely, Shivaji's yeah, army. absolutely. And I'm just wondering then, because the Mughals were um, largely constituted by, yeah, the Kunbis, but also the Mahars, um, what's happening there? Is there, I mean, is there some kind of link? So there is, but in, in exchange, because again, Mahars, because of their martial past are more privileged amongst um, right. the so-called untouchable caste in those, in those areas, right? right. In yeah. that come from, including where Arvi Mori comes right. from. And I just don't know whether it does, so then does Mawali become this kind of derogatory term the way that we know it when, when it enters into the city? So is it, I'm just, it's very curious. It's purely conjecture. Is it like an right. urban, slang which then is a 20th century phenomena uh, yeah no it uh, i mean my my sense is that it acquires new meaning in this derogatory way uh, in uh, in the urban setting the the meaning can be derived uh, and i suspect uh, you know the way you were laying out the chronology mughals coming to in, uh, uh, to, uh, to the deccan encountering uh, the marvels mm -hmm. and terming them mawalis it can possibly happen i mean i i think it may happen and uh, and calling them mawali but uh, the, uh, the, in Bombay city, it's, uh, in the translation of the Communist Manifesto, Mawalis are the lumpen proletariat. Yeah. So, and the lumpen proletariat, of course, are is a, was, they used it in a derogatory way. Exactly. Right? Because they are the ones who can be mobilized to break strikes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? So for the communists, they were de it, it's a derogatory term. Mawali, as we know it now, uh, is a derogatory term. And it acquires this meaning yeah. uh, in the 19th and 20th century. Yeah. No, it's really fascinating because I mean, I'm just, I'm struggling with like, how do you then understand? I mean, is there something by proxy that we can then understand? Mahars were also part of the textile industry. Mahars, yeah. I'm, yeah. I mean, they, some of them were, I mean, and then there were so many others also, right? I mean, it's a, it's regional politics. So it's, yeah. uh, it's Delhi versus the regions. Right? Yeah. I mean, you'll find, uh, yeah, uh, you, you'll find uh, not just Mahars, but you'll find many other groups also who were part of this, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in this anti-Delhi, anti-Mughal push. Uh, right. So I, I'm not sure about the relationship between Mahars and uh, the Marathas or the Kunbi Marathas uh, at this time uh, in, in Shivaji's army or his descendants. Mm -hmm. right. there, I suspect there may have been tensions too between them. They may have aligned too, but they have aligned in a thrust for an anti-Delhi uh, anti push. They may have aligned against in an anti-Mughal politics. Mm -hmm. But uh, they may, I suspect there may have been tensions too. Okay. Um, thank you. If I can just really quickly ask the second one. I, I, I'm i just wondering in the Mira conspiracy case, Dangi yeah. actually very interestingly dismisses his reading of Marxism and actually even the Gandhi versus Lenin pamphlet. Yeah. And it's really interesting because some, there's something happening after 28 and in the right. Mira. Yeah. And I'm just curious about whether you think there is a change in uh, the communists, but especially these early communists like Dange and Miraskar, on their understanding of caste by the time of the Meerut. Meerut. I mean, uh, there is a, uh, I mean, not really a very profound change or perceptible change. There is a, cha there is a change in their understanding of Marxism because now they've, you know, they've uh, read more uh, around Marxism. They've met more intellectuals who've been traveling through South Asia at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they have links with the Communist International. Uh, earlier, they were shying away from those links. Uh, particularly, Dange was not very sure about Marxism, really, by Gandhi versus Lenin. 
uh, right? Uh, because it's, a, it's a, he believed it's a foreign ideology, uh, etc. So he was so he was not very sure about Bolshevism. Mm -hmm. But by the late 1920s, early 1930s, there is a change in their uh, in what they have read in their dealing with uh, understanding of the communist movement. Uh, I'm not sure about caste how it, uh, if it changes drastically. I don't think so, right? Because some of this understanding. Uh, this belief that caste is class, I think you can see that run through in the 20th century. Okay. So even uh, recently I was reading uh, EMS Namudripad's uh, uh, collection of essays published by Leftward. Mm -hmm. And he even he is saying in the 1970s that caste is class, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So that I don't see changes much. Yeah, I suspect. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, welcome. So there's a question by Sanil. Is Sanil here? I don't see him anymore. Yeah, no, oh. he's, he's referenced Rao Saib Kasbi's book. Yes. And yeah, so that uh, one slide that I mentioned uh, that about Anathema, uh, well, that's, I mean, I borrowed from, uh, 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 cited Rao Saib Kasbi's book. In the... Yeah, and earlier in a comment, he talks about the contribution of Narayan Meghaji Lokhande. Lokhande, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so which, I, uh, which also you find that uh, reference also in Outcast Bombay. Okay, so those are more by way of He starts both uh, 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 union for the workers in the in the eighteen eighties and a caste movement almost at the same time simultaneously. Okay, so I'll hand over to Komal and then Aprajita can come in. Komal, please go ahead. Hi, Juni. Thank you so much for this lovely presentation. Yeah. I am looking forward to reading your book, actually, and hopefully even review because like, it's a great interest to me. My work is also on Bombay and on caste and labor right. and yeah. mode of production. So you can just go on with that. Um, so um, just to sort of quickly uh, go over, I, I had like three quick questions. Um, the first one is actually on uh, Marxist strategy. Like, I mean, mm. come to think of it, uh, the communists in India thought of bourgeois revolution as a way of desiccating caste, as you call it. Or uh, in other words, this basically viewed more like a feudal remnant or something along those lines. And right capitalism was seen as something that would uh, you know, revolutionize and break these feudal bonds. Um, and the second thing that you mentioned is also about, uh, you know, these early communists having a fair bit of travel across Europe and, you know, familiarizing them uh, themselves with literature um, across uh, and debates across uh, that are happening amongst communists there. Um, but like, you know, in 18th century, like Marx and Engels have been actively dealing with this question of strategy, right? Like on right. two levels, one is with relation with race, where they right. view it as something that is an economic phenomenon and not some part of some cultural superstructure, right? right? And the second thing is also about the validity of bourgeois revolution as a real strategy, which happened in Russia, where Marx right. wrote those letters to Vera right. Zasulich in explaining that it's not like a you know, uh, super theory and, you know, communist revolution, uh, sorry, capitalist um, uh, sort of re bourgeois revolution is not something that it could be applicable to so-called non-Western context uh, so neatly. Even Gramsci in Italy has some similar sort of reservations on that. Yeah. So I was wondering whether this strategy itself was ever under question by Indian communists, right? Con considering that caste became such a central topic, not just among communists, but also reformers in the early 20th century, right? right. Um, my second question is actually uh, on literature and this usage of what Gopal Guru calls as negative language by right. um, the Dalit Panthers. And um, you, and, and I'm really curious, like this sort of adoption of, or this embracing of lumpen proletariat, like how much can it be interpreted as something that's like, you know, in sort of considering Dalits as a, identifying Dalits as a ka, uh, lumpen proletariat in objective sense, because I mean, yeah, uh, vast majority were 
employed as badlis but then also like there was a significant portion who were employed in the organized Absolutely. sort of sector yeah. right so they were what you would call working class in um, yeah, there was a class division within the Dalit movement. Absolutely. Yeah, precisely, right? And also the Sambar Mahar divide as, and there's yeah. so many, it just goes on. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so like, I mean, this sort of uh, uh, response to my knowledge was also like a response to this white collar literature and a response against educated Dalits and so on. So I was wondering like how much of it was happening in conversations with communist because you mentioned and this was really interesting is that the translations also happened in sanskritized marathi right yeah the, in so, abstract yeah, yeah. yeah. so, so the dalit panther sort of literature in some sense with its whole rabelaisque uh, mm -hmm. you know way of embracing obscenity and you know right. uh, vulgarity is also sort of intended at that and thirdly like uh, this is based on the presentation where you mentioned that ambedkar uh, took capitalism seriously with the formation of ILP. And that was to me quite striking because, I mean, he became the vice president of the Bombay Textile Labor Union in 19, I think, 31. And no. then uh, he was constantly sort of engaging with the socialist party who, uh, and Ashok Mehta, Absolutely. whom he regarded right. as a future Absolutely. labor leader and not the communist. So I was wondering, like, what is this sort of sort of antagonism with communists and not like socialists in general, like what was so wrong uh, with the communist party, yeah. right? So these are my three questions. No, 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 no that, those are great thought. questions. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Thank you. these are great questions. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe when I answer your first question, I'll, uh, I'll uh, ask you to uh, clarify less, just a little bit, but let me start from the third and the second, which are still fresher in my mind. Uh, so th the, the, the second question about uh, literature, the Dalit writers and uh, you know these are uh, uh, people like uh, Dasal, uh, then uh, the, the also other other Dalit writers, uh, even Bagul and all. They are part of this network uh, of uh, Bombay intellectuals, and uh, which Anjali Nerlikar also has actually uh, uh, has laid it out. Uh, if you look at his book Bombay, uh, look look at her book Bombay Modern which many intellectuals, Marathi uh, uh, intellectuals, also English language writers, they're all uh, working in a network. They're all part of a group, right? They're talking to each other. Now, with, when it comes to Dalit literature and its uh, use of what uh, you were saying, uh, Gopal Guru uh, describes as some uh, problematic language, it, it, it's a it's a strategy that has been worked out and through uh, uh, has come through a lot of interaction with some of the other intellectuals. So for instance, uh, Dasal's uh, a very famous friend was Dilip Chitre. And Dilip Chitre was the one, and uh, then there is another Marathi critic called uh, uh, Kulkarni. Is it VM Kulkarni? I'm not sure. Uh, and these people, some of these people have traveled abroad, have now seen uh, 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 some of the performances of black writers and playwrights on stage in the US are inspired by the anger in the 1960s and are telling the Dalit writers to emulate this anger. Right? Uh, in fact, there's, uh, Kulkarni has a very famous quote that you know, it's easier for the middle class Marathi writers, uh, upper middle class, upper class Marathi writers uh, to be angry because they have social capital, but it's uh, that much more difficult uh, for the lower caste. Uh, uh, so, you know, he's, he's coaxing them to get, you know, bring that. Uh, even somebody like M.N. Van Khede, who was an important Dalit intellectual and who does a PhD in uh, English literature, and he does a PhD on uh, on black, on African American literature, and he uh, uh, in the 1960s, and so he has seen the rise of uh, uh, the Black Power movement, etc., in the U.S. And when he goes back in the second half of the 1960s to uh, to Bombay to Maharashtra, he publishes uh, some of his findings and meets some of the Dalit writers and also encouraging them. Right. So this. Uh, uh, the some of the strategies of the Dalit Panther writers, they you know it's it's a very well thought out uh, plan where in which many people have contributed uh, uh, for them to write in a particular way. 
express themselves in a particular way. Right? Uh, the, uh, the, the third question on, uh, uh, on what's the, that Ambedkar seems to have been uh, more uh, happy or could align with, so, uh, with socialists more easily than communists. I think some of it, a, maybe some of it may be personality differences, but some of it really actually is that uh, the the elision of the caste question among communists, which he feels is the elision of the caste uh, caste question. Right. So some of it, uh, of course, it has to do with who are the Indian Marxists, early Indian Marxists, and uh, all that. Uh, but uh, and then the strategy to take power. Uh, for um, uh, do the communists have a viable strategy to take power, capture power in India? That's the question that Ambedkar uh, asks himself, right? Uh, and for him, probably it seems like uh, the communists uh, don't have a strategy to a capture power, and more importantly, address the question of caste within him in any way that he thinks is uh, uh, in any important way, right? Or any detailed way, so I think th that's one of his uh, reservations about uh, some of the. I think some of it is uh, could be personal, but some a lot of it is ideological. A lot of it is about how do you capture power, and can you then address the question of caste in it? And then the first question: uh, Can you clarify what what sort of strategies did you have in mind? Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean for. Uh, for uh, Marx and Engels to race, of course, uh, they have uh, considered racism and have seen how uh, race uh, slavery was important to uh, the production, to the making of the capitalist system. Uh, but uh, can you just say just a little bit more? Yeah. Or refresh no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I'm talking about the debates that were um, happening like around uh, Late 18th, 19th century in Russia, right. and where uh, NDR or uh, bourgeois revolution, like I mean, with the right. commune system which was already in place there, uh, right. the communists over there were, uh, you know, again looking at, looking at that question in a very sort of stagist way, right? Like we'll have capitalism or right. bourgeois right. revolution, which will sort of, then you'll have mechanization and all these right. you know, yeah. antiquated commune systems will wither away and you know so on and so forth, which yeah. concerned a lot of communists such as Vera Sashulich, who wrote to Marx. And there were these uh, three amazing letters that came out of it. Uh, Marx also wrote to this Russian journal whose name I cannot pronounce. <laughs> Otisist Benye Zapisky. And um, there also he elucidates like why this strategy of bourgeois revolution was something that uh, worked in England and mm -hmm. in yeah. Western Europe, and that may not necessarily work in Absolutely. Russia. So there, that whole idea of uh, Marxism being Eurocentric itself is addressed so uh, elaborately, right, right? Like by Marx himself. And uh, my question was that whether similar debates happened uh, in India, right? Like, I mean, there were attempts by Dange and others to theorize cars to try and understand where this is coming from, right? And at the same point of time, but they were also quite insistent on the bourgeois revolution as absolutely. Yeah. You know, so there was a certain understanding that caste itself is feudal. So I was trying to sort of understand whether uh, there were similar sort of debates over strategy or were they yeah. sort of, you know, shooting? I mean, in the 1920s and 30s, we don't see too much debate on this strategy, particularly about caste, right? I, I at least I haven't encountered them. Right? Uh, I'll have to uh, maybe do detailed archival work in the Communist Party of India archives, etc. But whatever I've seen, uh, and uh, I haven't seen much uh, on. Uh, uh, self-reflexivity on the Eurocentrism uh, 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 and uh, on an understanding of uh, uh, or a centering of caste uh, in among the communists. Yeah. I've, I haven't seen that much, uh, right? They, from what sense they've made of Marx, they believe this, that the stages way is the way, right? The stages way will deal with, uh, uh, is, the, is the mantra sort of, of, uh, bringing about an Indian revolution. Okay. Uh, 
I haven't, uh, yeah, yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen them reflect, sit and reflect or, you know, there may be some disagreements, of course, there, there were disagreements between people, they may have been, uh, I mean, and as you see it with some of the rhetoric uh, of the, uh, of the anti brahmin leaders in the communist movement, movement itself, uh, there were disagreements, but then there is no, there is no, nobody sitting and reflecting on this in the 1920s and 30s, or saying that, you know, uh, maybe probably our understanding of capitalism is uh, is askew because I mean as I'm arguing that uh, Bombay industrial capitalism is relying centrally on caste. Right? Uh, uh, in e even in coming into being, which is uh, that understanding is absent, right? which is why caste, if it's redundant, uh, then anybody who is trying to mobilize along caste lines is reactionary. Can I bring in Anubhav here? He had a interesting articulation which bring which will bring us a little bit back into bombay and the urban uh, for those of us anubhav do you want to come in and speak and ask your question so yeah so again thank you Junaid. Uh, very 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 really enjoyable talk um, okay. the first question was actually about the brother movement i was some years back with some very basic work on other movement so i was just wondering if you observed there were any conjunction between the brother movement and then the Marxist mobilizations after the war. Right. And then the second one is about this one. So uh, about the language question. So, you know, right. uh, that uh, this this shift which occurs in Indian, in the Bhasha literature, in the vernacular literatures, from the mid to the late night, depending on which language you're talking about, I think it right. in different languages. And there's this uh, sort of shift which occurs in the vernacular of South Asia from the mid to the late 19th century. Um, so that's been spoken about, but you know, I, I wonder what you think about this whole language, the, the way in which the language itself changes, not just how, not just, so the change is not simply in what we are uh, talking about, but how we are talking about, which is the whole right. content and form debate. Right. Which, you know, yeah. So that, and, and that shift is happening because there is, uh, you know, there is greater exposure to the urban or there is greater interaction with the urban. Right. Not only in the critical terms, but also, you know, I mean, if you were to think of Maharashtra, you know, in Nagpur at that time is part of the central province. But, you right. know, there, there, there are many such, uh, you know, provincial towns which are also coming up, which have, uh, you know, their priorities of the large. So, so a greater interaction with the sort of nascent, I shouldn't say nascent, but uh, the urban, well, that's right. more convenient right. term, is bringing this semiotic shift also in the languages. In the languages, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. Uh, see, uh, orality, of course, is very important in the propagation of the communist movement, right? Uh, and speeches and the way people are talking about things, uh, what they're understanding and the way they are talking about. So in uh, this uh, anti-Brahmin uh, or public sphere in uh, Bombay, people have spoken, people like Veena Naragal have spoken about the intensity of the rhetoric uh, and, you know, the, or, and the language that is used. Very, very uh, often very abusive, uh, the expressing anger. And some of that is, informs the way in which even the communists in Bombay are propagating Marxism uh, in, uh, in Bombay city in the 1920s. Uh, right, uh, so uh, so uh, uh, it's and it's very. I mean, it's a. It was very common for labor leaders to abuse uh, 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 to abuse mill owners, for instance, and really, really, really abuse, right? Mm -hmm. From uh, something like Haram Khor or Gadhav, Donkey, right? All that you know, you'll stand in front of the gate, and uh, uh, there is that those things that were used. Uh, uh, some of those languages that were used to mobilize and to a uh, lo lot of cheering by the audience, uh, which is why they, the communists were the heroes of, uh, uh, of uh, the labor leaders, because they're standing on the mill gates and calling the mill owner, uh, Gadhav, Haramkor, etc., fat ass, right? So there is absolutely, there's something in uh, the, uh, if there is something about the urban setting, there is something about the public sphere broadly, in which I was saying the debates about uh, uh, among Brahmins and anti-Brahmin intellectuals take place, which Veena Narigal has spoken about uh, in the 19th and uh, 20th century. 
there is something about the urban setting uh, in which this uh, language becomes very common practice. And then this language, uh, I mean, it's, this is not your question, but later on gets something like this is borrowed by uh, somebody like Bal Thakre, right? who's also addressing the workers who are now jobless, et cetera, particularly in the 1980s, who's also addressing uh, them in some of this language, which gets worked out in the 1920s. Uh, but uh, so there's something about the way in saying, but about semiotics, I'm not sure actually. I mean, I, I'm not sure I understand and I don't know. Uh, can you just explain on semiotics and... So I mean, I mean I, I, the question to, to, I'm I'm right now teaching this PhD course on modern Indian literature, and right. you know so so as part of that, one usually talks about how uh, the bhashas undergo transformation from polarity to textuality through the 19th century. I think it's a right. different right. thing. Yeah. Bhasha, right? It happens yeah. early for Bangla and Urdu. Happens right. in the mid century for Malathi. And Absolutely. For other languages. Now. So the conceptual registers you have to talk about things. So for example, the everyday is an important part of, uh, of contemporary writing and the way in which we speak. So we have the slang is, is a very everyday thing, right? right? Now, typically most languages did not have, a, most of the classical languages do not have a register for the everyday. They have the register for the exalted. They have, you know, they have conceptual notions to talk about, you know, great events right. and things and so on and so forth. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and in the Bhasha, that transition happens through the 19th century as uh, they start dwelling more on the everyday and less on the, you know, epic. Epic, right, absolutely. I, I know what you mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because then there is also, for example, the shift which happens in Urdu from the Dastan. Yeah. Uh, right. And which is a little more apparent in the Nazm in the way, you know, then starts yeah. talking about the evolution and so on. And, you know, about the class, for example, the movement from Chandrakanta to Seva Sadha. In, 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 right. In, 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 right. In, right. The kind of things you write about, the kind of stories you want, and, right. the, you know, that shift is happening. So, in that. No, 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 no absolutely. Yeah. And the, and the shift, uh, and you can see that in the translation of uh, some of the Marxist pamphlets too. Right. So when you are talking about something exalted, or uh, I mean, I, I'll use your term exalted, but also let's say something abstract, right? Uh, how will you translate anything which is abstract? I mean, you really, uh, in any language, if, if it's Marathi, you'll go to Sanskritized Marathi. If it's Urdu, you'll go to uh, either Persianized Urdu, right? This was some of the stra uh, strategies that were available to people. Uh, when they were translating something exalted, something abstract, something conceptual. Uh, but when you're then talking about the everyday, right? because now if you're mobilizing uh, the workers uh, on, for, uh, on a Marxist vision for a revolution, you also have to address the everyday. You, of course, you'll grasp capital in uh, 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 conceptual categories are important to gra gra grasp capitalism in abstract, but then you also have to uh, understand uh, some of the, uh, the everydayness, right? The, the coming to work for 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, right? Time, for instance, in the way you understand it. Uh, so, uh, uh, so for that then, uh, you know, what sort of language is av available to you in talking about that everydayness? Uh, and uh, so by, uh, by design and by, by design and by default, then you see this two, uh, th there is a, uh, th there is a upper register and then the, the, there is a lower register, which uh, uh, happens. Uh, th there's a division or separation between the upper register and the, and the lower register, which you see in the translation of the communist manifesto. Right. Uh, then some of the conceptual categories are more the abstract conceptual categories are uh, also uh, rendered in Sanskritized Marathi uh, because they can be more exact. But uh, in the lower register, some of the categories are very slippery. For instance, Mavali. Right? Mavali, as I was, we were I was describing, Mavali is a very, you know, you can't pin it down. What exactly is a Mavali and where exactly is the origin of the term Mavali? 
Thanks, Junaid. I think Anubhav dropped out. Uh, For sure. Oh, yeah. Ago. Uh, I have, there's a question from Aprajita, and I think Sanil wanted to also have a yeah. conversation. Aprajita, do you want to ask your question, and then we can move to Sanil's? I mean, Sanil can go first. It's fine. All right, Sanil, uh, I, I think you wanted to add to the last uh, conversation or uh, last comments that I made. Sanil's comment too. Yeah. No, understanding, yeah. Uh, Sharad Patil and Umesh Bagade, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And Sharad Patil, of course, comes from the communist movement and uh, then uh, from uh, his uh, disillusionment with the communist parties, the two communist parties. He then also explores Maoism. Uh, but then also has a critique of that. Uh, and uh, 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 also, yeah, also Umesh, yeah. Uh, 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 somebody like Sharad Patil, I've read a little bit more than Umesh, actually. Yeah. So yeah, so, uh, uh, so Sharad, pa Sharad Patil, uh, uh, of course, his disillusionment uh, uh, leads to a very, very peculiar understanding of, uh, a very interesting understanding of caste. Uh, which is, uh, uh, he says, caste, uh, now um, I may be butchering or in, my, in the paraphrasing, I mean, I, uh, look, caste is the, uh, is the, uh, uh, Buddhism is the subconscious, subconscious and caste is the conscious and he wants to reverse it through ideological work. So yeah, so those uh, understanding of caste, you know, absolutely, one needs to engage with Sharad Patil, uh, and somebody like Sharad Patil has engaged with all the communist movements, uh, including the Maoist movement, but has not, uh, 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 but did not get, uh, uh, but uh, and then comes up with his own understanding of caste, right? For which ideological work is very important. Sanil, do you want to come in and respond or should, should we move on? You do, you, you can, if you have the luxury of switching on your camera and audio. Okay, fine. Aprajita, all yours. Um, thank you. Uh, this is such an interesting talk. I, um, okay, so I have two sets of, two questions and I'll keep them brief. Uh, number one, um, from the 1930s onwards, you see a lot of these Bombay, like Bombay Plan documents that are talking about organization as a way out of historical poverty. And there's a lot of talk around plan planning commissions and uh, that eventually end up as um, the, uh, the planning commission post-colonial. Yeah. Um, so in, so I, I see these as some sort of like Fabia socialist, some um, economic determinism working. But within that, where are, um, if you see any political leaders at the municipal level or uh, other caste, um, uh, or, or other mentions of caste in these, this, this promise of modernity from the 1930s to the 50s, that would be interesting. And the second question I have is about historiography. Uh, so from Rajna and Chandavakar to even Sheetal Chabria, there is this um, uh, the attempt to use uh, caste, or, sorry, labor as the, as the category through which to understand Bombay and its right. various municipal governance and um, right. whatever. I'm, I'm making a really large story. So, um, and, and then they struggle also uh, with caste. I mean, not Rajnarayan so much as the later historians right. who are trying to come out, sort of Foucault comes in, Marx comes in and um, I'm not all taking away from their work, but it's a very, it's a heavy mix yeah. of a lot of theoretical frameworks that you're talking about very specific presence. And, and, and they, even if they don't start off by talking about caste, they have to negotiate at the end of the day in the everyday working of the city. So yeah. I, I want you to make a comment on like the historiography that's coming up on late colonial Bombay right now, especially in the last few years and how they may be lacking or not lacking when it comes to understanding caste. I mean, yeah. See, caste. Uh, I mean, uh, see, somebody like Raj Narayan Chandavarkar, you know, he was he had engaged with caste, and you know, so, some of his footnotes and some uh, some of the stray remarks that he makes, it was very apparent. Our team that he was poised to write something on caste, and had dealt with the question of caste. Uh, and, at least a portion of cars. I don't know if he would have written yeah. uh, on it, but it was very apparent that he, yeah, you know, he, uh, he, uh, his 
some of his stray footnotes, etc., that he's written or stray comments through them. Uh, Caste, I mean, I, I don't know if uh, historians, when you pose, uh, how would you deal with caste centrally? Should it be, should it come when you're conceptualizing your project or should it come from the archive itself? Right. right. Uh, that, that's, a, I mean, for me, that's a, that, that's a question. I think uh, if you try and just look for it in the archives, if you have not post, uh, posed it in your conception, Right. Mm -hmm. You may find it difficult to look at, to find materials uh, in the archives because, you know, the archives will not, there'll be stray references, right? Uh, there'll right. be stray references right. on uh, uh, particularly caste or, uh, or, uh, or lower caste individuals. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so then it, 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 may, it may become difficult to address the, the question of caste, right? But if you... Uh, Pose it in the time at the time of the conception of the project itself, right? I, I think it may be uh, easier for you. So uh, I mean, if if you're if you're open to problematizing caste in the time at the time of the conception itself, I think you will find material. Mm. Right? No, but I'm I'm looking how how labor trumps uh, um, caste as a category in studying urban right. Bombay. Right. I, 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 th I mean, uh, I think it shouldn't trump, right? I think uh, I, I should. I think labor is important and and caste, right? There has to be uh, an interaction. So if labor is trumping caste, my my question would be: At what moment is labor trumping caste? What historical moment is labor trumping caste? Right. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, 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 and particularly in your evidence, at what historical moment is labor trumping caste? Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, 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 so I think if if you if you're in your conception of your project, if you're open to see that labor and uh, then also caste uh, will be important uh, is important, then I think uh, you'll see more and more work on both labor and caste. But both are. I mean, I think uh, I, I'm not mentioning it just as a cop out by saying that labor and caste both are important but you'll see an interaction between both of them and that's what um, you know i i uh, i in my research that's what i found right so uh, when i mentioned the built environment built environment is right. the classic right. uh, location where you find class right you look at a neighborhood yeah. you look at a locality yeah. and say ah this is a rich neighborhood rich locality this is a poor neighborhood poor locality but if you look at the way in which that locality was built, came about, uh, etc., the process, right? you'll see that caste played mm -hmm. an important role in it. So you can capture some of it through right. labor. But I think if you look at right. caste, then you'll be able to shed more light on it. Right. Okay. okay. And maybe through okay. gender, maybe even more. I mean, yeah. yeah. Both, both labor and just... caste are gendered. Yeah. No, and, and just to, about the first question, sorry, I'm coming back to it. It's just um, like planning documents and city documents, yeah. city planning documents right. from the 30s to 50s. Do you see past plane or, I mean, this is more at the level of primary data and not- Yeah, no, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a, yeah, urban, yeah, absolutely. So the Bombay plan, of course, was designed by the Bombay industries, right? Uh, right. And uh, yeah. the mention of caste is, not, uh, I think they're not in their rhetoric, they're in, in the document itself, in the writing, you don't see the term caste come up. And maybe because urban planning is seen as a scientific exercise and they think caste is not scientific enough. Right? Okay. But the okay. effects that those plans have, have really important caste effects. Right? Right. Because some of the yeah. localities or the slums that they are saying that you want to get rid of, mm -hmm. many of the people living in those slums are come from the Dalit caste particularly in the 1950s okay. and all when some slum clearance happened, 50s and 60s, right. when some clearance right. happens uh, throughout, but the 50s and 60s, you see that some of the slums that have been relocated have, many of them are Dalits. And you see uh, evidence of uh, them being Dalits because when you see the relocated slums, you'll see that there are Buddhist viharas. Right, in right, okay. Right, okay. so in their language, in the language they are not using, uh, they may not use caste, depending on the plans, right? You, you may not, you know, as, as caste, 
they will i mean they'll they'll talk about they'll talk about class and they'll talk about backwardness etc which you know you can tease right. and think uh, that they are you know make a case that they are in that they are referencing caste too right right yeah caste okay. is a term may not come up yeah okay. thank you so much thank you yeah, this is really this is really interesting because uh, we've seen this in our work in cpr in delhi as well this thing about resettlement colonies having the buddhist viharas the same mm -hmm. thing about and we're there's an ongoing engagement now with the master planning process in delhi where again the plan doesn't centrally acknowledge i mean it may be a term thrown in here and there but it doesn't but you know clearly the the effects on certain kinds of communities which which Absolutely. have large proportions of bahujan uh, is is very high and what we've been doing is working on the participatory planning aspect of it so it's really unsettling when you have very large numbers of objections and suggestions mobilized from slums and informal settlements and you know communities where there are there would be higher concentrations of dalit bahujans uh, when these, I mean, so, so ostensibly they have to welcome the fact that more participation is happening, but it's very unsettling because all of these counter articulations are, are you know, very politely, but you are basically throwing the th thing back and saying this plan is not working for us. Right. And, and interestingly, in the responses also caste is absent. So absent. nobody yeah. is talking about caste, yeah. but we all know that right. the, the identity is there. So it's very absent. interesting that you said this. Because I didn't think of it from the lens of caste. I'm a planner, so that's why I'm... Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, yeah. No. And you see that. I mean, you see that in Bombay, uh, you know, in across the 20th century. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it's still playing out. We're in the 21st it's still century, out, exactly. we're still in Absolutely. the same boat. Striking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Partho had a question. He had asked me to come to him uh, last after everyone was done, which is which is typical for our webinars, uh, which for our workshop. He he usually yeah. has the closing question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not. Uh, it's just uh, uh, thanks, Junaid. Uh, so so let me just push on. Uh, your response to Aparajita in that sense. And I'm just trying to understand the issue to which you sort of uh, started the um, talk with. Um, uh, and uh, two kinds, so, so, uh, two broad kinds of issues. Um, first, the notion of how does caste persist in the city and how do people feel that caste persists in the city, right? Yeah. So when you have essentially the capitalist, you said capitalism mediating workers through caste, uh, yeah. and yeah. you're doing it as part of both uh, recruitment strategies and structures and as part of the yeah. story. And then when people see themselves living in let's take one aspect of caste in the village, which is segregation of settlement. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the issues that you're supposed to sort of, when you move to the city and become anonymous, that segregation is supposed to sort of be mitigated, but it, mm -hmm. given the nature of how you have entered the city uh, and the chores and the structures, the segregation in some sense still persists, right? Okay. Absolutely. But do you see that segregation and your place in the city, your spatial place in the city, uh, through the lens of you being a worker and therefore living in a worker colony? Or do right. you see it through the lens of you being of a particular caste and therefore being as you would see if it were in the village, right? So that's, that's the first, and does your work sort of, uh, does uh, the work that you have been looking for, unfortunately I haven't read the book, so, uh, does it somehow address this question? And do you think it's a question that can be addressed given the kind of uh, right. engagement that's happening in that particular space, right? right. Uh, and in that context also, in the manner in which you're thinking about, uh, you said the communists and the unions and that process, and how does caste enter the labor mobilization and the unionization process, right? So, so one way uh, it sort of happened partly in Bengal and so on and so forth is at the leadership of the unions and the negotiations, you need people who can read and write. Right. A certain degree of literacy and structures and that 
historically, especially at that point in time, is an attribute that is right. essentially mediated by caste. Upper right. caste are much more likely to be literate Absolutely. than those caste. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, even though your body politic is of a particular caste, your leadership ends up being of a different caste because the attributes that you need for that leadership. Right. Uh, and, and this is not something that is in some sense being seen in labor movements across in Europe and so on and so forth, where you know, these attributes are much are much more homogenous. They're differentiated by class, but not so much for other kinds of attributes. Right. So is that an is that something which does happen? And then how does that get negotiated in some sense? No, no, that, that, those are great questions, actually. And <laughs> how does yeah. all of this change with independence? You know, because a lot of your yeah. structure that, that's that's basically what one is sort of getting a sense of. Yeah. No, um, no, those are great uh, questions. And um, uh, see, if you let's say you're a Dalit worker, right? Uh, Dalit worker looking for a house, right? Or looking for a place to stay uh, in the 1910s, 1920s. And then because of your last question, we can also, uh, I can also bring it later on to the 1950s and 60s and 70s uh, through a more concrete example. Uh, so if you're a Dalit worker looking for a room to stay uh, in a particular tenement, right? Owned by a private landlord, right? Or you want a, uh, a job in a mill, the, one of the reasons why you may be a Dalit worker may be denied uh, an opportunity to rent in a tenement, even if that person may be able to afford it, is because of caste. So when it comes to things like renting, et cetera, you know that you've been denied because of caste and you're aware of that, right? But then you also are a Dalit worker. So when people are mobilizing along class lines during strikes, you'll go and join, join the class movement too. So for a, a Dalit worker, it's not an either or, right? You experience many of your things that you experience in the city is also because of your caste status. Right? Uh, and of course, also your class status. Right? So you will, so you'll, you'll uh, at various moments, of course, you will become part of the communist movement like somebody like R.B. More did. Right. So uh, for, the, for a Dalit worker, it may, it, it's not either or. I mean, they'll, they'll experience caste. And this is precisely what, to, coming to your second question, I think in the way the Indian uh, Marxism and the communist movement was structured where, you know, the people who are mediating Marx and translating Marx and, uh, and uh, negotiating with the mill owners, et cetera, all come mostly from the upper caste. Uh, and come from a milieu in which they believe that you know you can reform caste out if whatever has remained after capitalism and uh, all that. Then, then if a Dalit worker is saying, but really, see, I am not getting a job in a mill or in the docks, a better paying job because of my caste. There is this. There is a, a, a people have certain caste groups have dominated certain well paying sectors. But then the, the, at that time, the communist leader may not be able to, even if they understand it, even if they acknowledge it to the worker, but they can't bring it to the fore, right? Uh, or they can't bring it to the negotiation, negotiation table. Uh, in uh, 1928, actually they did, right? Uh, Ambedkar as a condition for supporting the strike by the communist union, says that, uh, said that you should acknowledge that the Dalit workers should get uh, better paying jobs. And the communists brought this to the mill uh, to the mill owners, and the mill owners said, "What rubbish! Why are we in the position to do that? It's your workers who are denying them jobs. We have nothing to do with it. It's your uh, the upper caste among the lower caste workers who are denying them uh, access to jobs. We have nothing to do with it." And they washed their hands. Right. So, to acknowledge something like caste. You have to also then acknowledge that uh, a caste is shaping the lives of workers and the workers, particularly Dalit workers, are experiencing caste also, along with class. So you need to have a theory which will acknowledge both of these. 
a theory and a practice. So then after independence, for instance, and let me give you that concrete example that I was mentioning. Uh, there's this uh, uh, famous Marathi writer called Daya Pawar, and uh, who uh, comes to the city and talks about his experience in the city in the 1950s after independence. Uh, he lives in a village in a segregated neighborhood, uh, comes from the Mahar caste, and comes to the city along with some of the Maratha Kunbi uh, people in the village. He comes along with them. He comes along with them to the city. And uh, they first uh, go to where the Maratha uh, Kunbi's family is living. Uh, his friend's family is, uh, is living. And he was de denied entry in the tenement. And uh, they offer him food, but he has to sit outside and eat food. This is after independence. So those things, I mean, caste practices are still continue uh, in some form or the other. I mean, caste, the thing is the caste also changes. Right? And I think one of the things with, uh, well, I think doing benefits of historical work is that you can see that some of the changes in caste. Right? But some of the experiences of caste that uh, Dalit workers uh, 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 experience or somebody like Daya Pawar, who's a writer, and in his uh, autobiography, Balute, who, which is translated in English, he has given this, his experience of uh, caste in the city. Uh, he's come along with the upper caste uh, 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 neighbor from the village, but uh, is denied entry into a chawl in Bombay. So it persists. Thanks, Janine. That's, yeah, sorry. Did you want to add something? Did I cut you off? I, I was just, I was just sort of um, wondering about because you brought in Bal Thackeray and so on, about the local politics of Bombay and how yeah. this, this sort of, as you said, uh, multiple experiences of a person in the city. Right. Uh, how does that then affect? his civic engagement with the city all right so his in a sense therefore uh, whether he supports the rpi whether he supports the shiv sena or the uh, cpi and so on and so forth as it goes forward uh, does 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 how, so, so broadly what i'm saying is how does this experience of the Dalit worker qua his caste and qua his worker right. status affect the way he votes or engages with the political right. life? Um, and how, how does that then therefore influence the politics of Bombay? Is the, it's a, it's a question. No, that, again, that's a wonderful, a great question. Uh, see, uh, if uh, you are uh, Dalit worker or, or any person actually, I mean, any caste, any person who are living in a slum which is uh, deemed illegal. The, your, you will be more receptive to messages from parties that are saying that we will legalize the slum. Right? That you'll have, the slum will uh, remain, you can stay, you'll have a footing in the city. So many of the uh, civic engagements of uh, many people in Bombay, uh, uh, it depends on on some of these uh, these uh, uh, these negotiations, some of these practical uh, realities. And something like Shiv Sena was was very important to this actually. Right, uh, since Shiv Sena gets a base through its shakhas, it gets a base in various parts of the cities uh, because it uh, it intervenes in the everyday life of uh, workers. Uh, even Dalits promises them things that they can do, and you know helps them navigate some of the lower levels of the state, and says that we may be able to legalize the slum, right? Or we will legalize the slum if we get elected, if uh, you elect us. Right. So you'll find that uh, Dalits uh, by the 70s and 80s are also voting for, and particularly by the 80s, after the labor movement has sort of collapsed in Bombay City. Uh, they, many of them do shift to also shift to the Shiv Sena. Vote for the Shiv Sena depending on those, those issues. 
Right. So RPI, of course, is the is the sentiment the party the sentimental favorite, so to speak, because it's the party of Ambedkar. But the RTI, RPI, of course, has also splintered into various factions. Uh, the dominant political parties have made sure that RPI has splintered into factions. The Dalit Panther that was formed in response to that in the 1970s has also splintered into factions. And one of the founders of the Dalit, Dalit Panther, Namdev Dhasal, has himself, uh, 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 by the early by the 1980s, early 1990s, particularly, he has joined the Shiv Sena. So you'll see that uh, some of the more practical issues. Uh, and the and the position of a political party on those issues play an important role uh, in uh, the support in, in the civic engagements of people. Now it all varies according to again you know there is class and then there is caste too. Uh, both of them, but you'll find Dalit supporting the Shiv Sena too by the 1980s and 1990s. And 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 do you find also uh, do you also discuss the role of that might have been placed by caste in the Datta Saman story of, I mean, as you said, the decline of the, of yeah. the, was caste leverage to essentially um, right. the, the death of the union, so to speak? I, I, see, I haven't studied actually that. I mean, uh, the, I mean, I haven't studied it, but my, see the, many of the workers in Bombay city starting from the 1920s come from what is called the Maratha Kulbi caste. So if you were to make a you know case or may, if you were to study, you may be able to find in the Datta Saman movement also. So the this and this is a very important caste cluster. Caste cluster. Uh, in the 1930s, when the caste census was there, they were one third of the population of the entire city and a sizable section of the textile mill workers, and maybe even 50, 60 percent of the textile workers. I suspect some of that would have remained into the Datta Saman movement too, uh, but I haven't studied it. So I, I've, I won't be able to say with any surety, but I suspect uh, there may be something to it, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So we're almost like closing in on two hours. Sure. Most exhausting. I hope it wasn't. <laughs> because yeah, no, it was, it was fun. Really I was fun to, to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we had, we had really good questions. And as you, you know, this is an urban workshop. So a lot of the usual, I mean, historians are a rarity in, in uh, you know, in, in our workshop. So I guess we're trying to get the most out of, uh, out of you. Sure, while you're it, yeah, it was really enjoyable. Eva. Thank you. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you for coming. Yeah. Thank you for agreeing to do this. And we'll stay in touch and we'll send you the link once the video, etc. is up. Oh, thank you, thank you yeah. everyone for staying late and uh, hope you have a good evening ahead. Thanks, Jalen. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. Bye.